Today I'm going to talk about bacterial protein secretion and targeting and give an overview of the subject, well at least cover a variety of different uh, secretion systems. Um, I've borrowed slides from Julia Lodge for some of this, because uh, she gave this lecture last year. I'm getting a bit of an echo there, so turn this volume down. So again, just to remind you where this fits in the course, you're going to have five lectures from me on bacterial protein secretion, various systems dedicated to this. This is the first one. Thursday we'll be talking about bacterial flagellum, then later following week type 3 secretion, something called ESX secretion, and sortase and LPXCG proteins. Now, before we start, we need to. Again, feel so much we need to look at what is the issue of. Um, what is the issue we're looking at here? What is uh, protein secretion uh, and export and translocation and so forth? Well, if we look at uh, bacterial cell envelopes, they come in two major varieties, the gram-positive cell envelope and the gram-negative cell envelope. Sometimes the term monoderm and diderm, these terms are used instead of gram-positive or gram-negative to describe the uh, construction of the cell envelope. So in the gram-positive or the monoderm there is a single cytoplasmic membrane, no outer membrane. There is this cell wall which will contain things like the peptidoglycan. And if proteins go across this cytoplasmic membrane, they can get out into the external milieu, they can get out into the cell wall. And effectively, in a gram-positive bacterium, secretion, export, translocation, they're all the same thing. You're just jumping across this one membrane. In gram-negatives, we have a, a rather more difficult situation because we have, we have these two membranes, the inner membrane and the outer membrane, spanning the periplasm, uh, which will in, in itself contain things like peptidoglycan. Um, and the ways in which these words are used some, is, a, is a little bit vari variable from one person to another, but some people would say that we should talk about secretion only when we're talking about getting across the whole cell envelope to the outside world. So across the inner membrane, the periplasm, and the outer membrane in one step. If we're talking about protein export, we're talking about just getting stuff out of the cytoplasm across that inner membrane and into the periplasm. And sometimes the term translocation, when you're referring to a particular membrane, you talk about translocation across that particular membrane. Um, and so we have translocation across the inner membrane or translocation across the outer membrane. Now, just to give you a bit more of a view of uh, insight into what's in that gram-negative cell envelope, which is going to be the target of this particular lecture, in fact, most of the lectures, three out of the five lectures, will be looking at gram-negative organisms. We have this inner membrane here with membrane proteins in it. We have the periplasmic space here with peptidoglycan and periplasmic proteins in it. Then we have the outer membrane and the lipopolysaccharide on the outside. So the challenge in gram-negative protein secretion is to get stuff all the way across. Now this is quite a busy uh, figure, but it just gives a flavour of the complexity uh, in terms of the variety of different uh, mechanisms, different protein secretion systems that exist in gram-negative bacteria. So this is from a review uh, by Michael Desvaux, who used to work here uh, with Ian Henderson, which he wrote a couple of years back, uh, trying to classify all these different systems and actually come up with unified nomenclature, unified, unified uh, naming systems for them. Now, I'm not expecting you to take much in from just looking at that. The key point is that we can classify these systems into two main varieties. There are those where there is... Uh, translocation across the inner membrane, export across the inner membrane first, the proteins then have a periplasmic 
intermediate, and then they go across the outer membrane. Or you can have complex protein machineries, protein assemblages, which span the whole cell envelope, spanning the inner membrane, the periplasm, and the outer membrane, all in one apparatus, all in one go, so that proteins going through that route do not have a periplasmic intermediate. They're not exposed to the periplasm. They go through all in one go. So that just puts the same thing in words. Either there is or is not a periplasmic intermediate that allows you to classify uh, the systems into these two broad classes. So if there's no periplasmic intermediate, we have this kind of nano machine. And type 1 secretion, type 3 secretion, type 4 secretion, and type 6 secretion all have this property where there is no periplasmic intermediate. Where there is a periplasmic intermediate, we have this first step, the translocation across the cytoplasmic membrane, uh, and a variety of systems, which we'll go into a couple of these in more detail, to do that. And then there's a second step where they get across the outer membrane. And then there are various systems for doing that. Type 2 secretion, type 5 secretion, the Schaffer and Usher system, these all have methods uh, for translocating across the outer membrane. So, the, starting with the most uh, fundamental secretion system, the SEC translocon. This is ubiquitous and it's essential. It's found in all the domains of life, all the three domains of life. It's found in eukaryotic, eukaryotic organelles as well. Um, and uh, we talk about SEC dependent secretion for secretion that is dependent on this particular uh, system. So, obviously, in gram positives, that is just secretion. In gram negatives, it's translocation across the cytoplasmic membrane we're talking about. Now, the proteins that go through this system have to be unfolded. So, in fact, they're, they're often uh, going through the system quite soon after they've been synthesized, and there may even be coupling of protein synthesis to export through the system. These proteins have a characteristic signal peptide, or leader sequence, as it's called, which... Um, targets them to the system, it is very easy to recognize in terms of kind of bioinformatic signatures. The transport across this system requires hydrolysis of ATP, it's ATP, ATP dependent, and as part of the secretion uh, mechanism, the signal peptide gets cleaved off. Now this SEC dependent system was often shoehorned into something called the general secretory pathway, tied in with uh, type 2 secretion and sometimes type 4 secretion. So you may sometimes see that term used. Now there are a number of players in this game. If, if we look at how stuff is getting across that inner membrane, uh, there is this membrane spanning complex, SEC YEG. Uh, there is uh, a series of proteins which are involved in targeting these proteins for secretion. And then there's SEC-A, which is the ATPase, which actually energizes this process and drives the uh, proteins through um, the, um, the SEC-YEG pore. So we often talk about the translocase as this whole complex that's involved in pushing the proteins through. This trimer of SEC-YEG forming a channel in the membrane and then SEC A is the ATPase. And that binds to this complex of SEC YEG. There are other proteins when we do screens for protein protein interactions and dependencies of the system. There are other proteins involved SEC DF, YAG C, YID C. These are all involved in enhancing translocation. Sometimes their precise roles are not clear. That's not, not all been sorted out yet, although there has been some progress. Um, the proteins are recognized by something called SRP, signal recognition particle, or, or SECB, as it's called in bacteria. Recognizing this N-terminal se signal sequence uh, up to uh, 20 to 30 amino acids, uh, sometimes even a bit shorter than that, maybe uh, 
down as low as 12 to 15. This is targeted to the transitor K, so the set B complex binds to sec A. Um, the SRP complex binds to a different uh, receptor, this FTSY. Uh, but if we look at the structure of the signal peptide, this is a cartoon form here. We can see in the, in, in the signal peptide this N region, um, which is typically polar, there's sort of the thionine and the handful, two, three other residues. Then you get into this H region, which is hydrophobic. Uh, that looks uh, in many ways like a transmembrane domain, and that's because it is actually targeted to the membrane. And then there's the C region, a short little tail of, of, of a few uh, polar residues, and then there's a cleavage site, and this gets cleaved off. There's a second system, which we're going to talk about in a moment, called TAP, which has a similar kind of signal peptide, but there is some variation. It has these this twin arginine motif in the signal peptide. So we've got this sec y, e.g. pore uh, forming. The energy is provided by sec A, hydrolyzing ATP. The protein motive force also probably plays a role in the translocation of these proteins, driving them through. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, sometimes you get coupling of the secretion with uh, the elongation at the ribosome, with the protein synthesis itself. Um, so uh, you, that also can help drive things through the system, drive these proteins through the system. So you've got sec B coming in here with sec A, uh, ATP uh, being uh, consumed to generate ADP, um, and uh, engagement with, the, 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 with this pore and going through. The, in the per, on the periplasmic side, there is a signal peptidase, and that's what actually cleaves off that uh, signal peptide as the protein comes through, as it's finished coming through. And once the protein has then gone into the uh, periplasm, it's then free to fold up, adopt its native fold, and actually become functional. So it has to stay unfolded as it threads its way through the pore. Uh, but after that, it's free to fold up. So the SEC uh, translocon is the most uh, widely used translocon for the purposes of getting stuff across the cytoplasmic membrane. But in the last um, 10, maybe even 15 years, there's been a lot of interest in a newly described translocon uh, known as the TAT translocon. It's not quite as widespread. It's found in many bacterial and archaeal inner membranes found in some plasmids, uh, plastids, I should say, as well. Um, uh, it takes its name from an abbreviation of twin arginine translocation. And this is, if you look in the signal peptide, you'll find, in the signal sequence there, you find these, this pair of adjacent arginine residues as a characteristic sequence motif for this system. Not always required. Sometimes you get lysines instead of arginines, but generally it's, it's that kind of very polar residue that's seen there. Now, this is unlike the SEC dependent system in that it doesn't require proteins to be unfolded. It actually quite re remarkably can translocate folded proteins across the membrane. Um, and um, if we're looking at um, bacteria, we see that there are many proteins that are, I think it's just saying most, I borrowed this from Judy, I don't know if she's put most there, but there are many uh, secretion, secretion of proteins crossing the inner membrane using TAT. The system relies on a complex of TAT A and TAT C integrated into the membrane. Um, there is this accessory protein, TAT-B, which is found in some bacterial species, but not in all of them. And the energy for translocation here is there's not, it's not driven by ATP. Instead, it's driven by the protein motive force driving things across that uh, membrane there. So here we have the ribosome producing the protein, protein delivered to TAT-ABC, and going through the system to come through to the other side. So how does it actually work? We have these twin arginines in the signal sequence. They bind, mediating binding to the TAT-B 
C complex or to tat C alone when tat B is not present. Tat A is then recruited and you get this weakening of the membrane and a conformational change in, in the tat C, tat B, C complex, pulling the substrate through the membrane. And you get a proton flux through the hole, which is partly driving the, the, the protein through as well. And then um, the membrane gets sealed up and the substrate gets released from the other side of the TAT uh, BC complex and then uh, gets, uh, has an encounter with the signal sequence peptidases on the periplasmic side, which cleave off the signal peptide just in the same way as it happens with the sex system, and your protein is released on the other side of the membrane. Okay, so with systems like SEC and TAT, we get proteins across that cytoplasmic membrane into the periplasm, across the inner membrane, as we call it, in gram negatives. Where do they go from there? Well, many proteins will just fold up and have a role in the periplasm. There are uh, at least 100, probably more than 100 proteins that, that actually inhabit the periplasm in gram negative bacteria. That's where they have their job. Some of those proteins will actually go into, be targeted into the inner membrane or into the outer membrane, become integral membrane proteins. Um, and many components of secretion systems that are actually involved in secreting things further afield out of the cell start off by using components that rely on the SEC or TAT uh, secretion systems. But if things are going to get outside the cell, we have to have this second step, translocation across the outer membrane. And uh, here are a number of different systems that we can talk about. The chaperone usher system, the, the type 5 secretion system, known as water transporters generally, and type 2 secretion. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a, an overview of each one of those. In later talks, we're going to cover some other secretion systems in a lot more detail, but here we're going to just go through a quick whistle-stop tour of these different systems. Now, chaperone usher, I already mentioned in a previous lecture, the one on E. coli, so I'm just going to remind you about that one. So if you remember, we said that there was this system where there was a periplasmic chaperone, which binds to these pillin subunits, while they're in the uh, periplasm, system in the right kind of folding, prevents them interacting with each other, it's pili from polymerizing in the periplasm. And then uh, there's an outer membrane usher, which acts as a platform for assembly. Uh, and these systems are involved in the assembly of different kinds of pili, type 1 pili and pack pili. And as I say, I've already covered this in lecture on E. coli. So I'm just putting this slide in here as a place marker, just to remind you kind of integrate your thinking uh, so that we're talking about systems here. We spoke about an organism earlier, but the th everything trying to be interconnects. Now, type 5 secretion uh, is a particular favourite of Ian Henderson, who some of you may have met, who works here as a bacteriologist. Um, now, the most common uh, kind of type uh, five secretion is the autotransporter. And what happens here is you have a signal sequence that targets the protein to the set translocon. Uh, that goes through uh, into the periplasm. Um, and the autotransporter has an, a number of different domains. There's an N-terminal, so-called passenger domain, which is what will actually provide the functional activity of the protein when all is said and done. Then there is a, a, a translocator based at the C-terminus. And this C-terminal translocator uh, enters into the outer membrane and forms a beta barrel. And in so doing, it provides a pore through which the rest of the protein goes, this, this N-terminal passage domain goes. So the beta domain forming the pore here, the passage domain here uh, in, in the periplasm, then gets threaded through uh, from the C-terminus towards the N-terminus. It folds up as it comes out the other end, and you usually end up with a system where 
the protein is tethered to the outer membrane uh, as one complete covalently linked protein with the beta domain in the outer membrane and the, uh, the passenger domain free. Now sometimes the passenger domain actually then gets uh, cleaved off uh, and becomes soluble and goes off into solution as well. And there are many examples of autotransporters in pathogens. There are now hundreds, there may even be thousands of them that have been catalogued uh, in bacterial, encoding bacterial genomes. But they encode things like adhesins, uh, degradative enzymes, cytotoxins. One example here, Neisseria gonorrhea has an IgA protease that is uh, secreted through an autotransporter route. So this protein specifically targets uh, the IgA immunoglobulins in, in um, body fluids, destroying them uh, and thereby uh, removing a barrier to uh, the growth of bacteria and colonization of those surfaces. Now, a, a, a variation on the theme of the autotransporter, another kind of type 5 secretion, is a so-called two-partner secretion. Uh, and effectively, what you have here are these two different functions we mentioned already separated out into two separate proteins rather than two separate domains. So you have this protein TPSB forming a channel in the outer membrane, 500 to 800 amino acids long, fairly conserved, and actually shows homology with the uh, equivalent domain in the um, autotransporter. Then you have the secreted protein, and these can be extremely large proteins, over 3,000 amino acids uh, at one extreme. Um, they have this so-called TPS domain at the end terminus, which allows them to interact with the um, secretion system through, going through the beta barrel. Um, and they typically form beta helical structures uh, and, and fold up outside the cell. Once they get through uh, this, this uh, pore formed by the beta barrels, they then form these uh, complex arrays of beta helices um, outside the cell. And there are a large number of these also now being catalogued. Here are some of them listed in Haemophilus influenzae. Uh, we have these so-called HMW adhesins, uh, which mediate adhesion. In Bordetella pertussis, filamentous hemagglutinin, one of the major virulence factors, which is involved in mediating adherence to host cells, uh, goes out this way. And then we have serratia marcescens, uh, producing a hemolysin uh, using this approach, using this mechanism. Okay, so that was type 5 secretion in uh, a few moments. Now we need to just quickly consider type 2 secretion. This is quite common in gram-negatives. It's got important roles to play in virulence and physiology of the cell. So all sorts of uh, enzymes get secreted this way. In Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, inside, say, the cystic fibrosis lung, it's secreting uh, elastase using this approach, using this mechanism. Many toxins go out this way. We already mentioned ETEC when we... Uh, and the, and the, the heat labile, the LT toxin, uh, we have also cholera toxin being secreted in this way. There's a spelling mistake that should say biogenesis, role in pillus biogenesis. So there are commonalities between this secretion of these proteins and the production of some kinds of pili. And uh, Again, this is a two-step process, as with type 5 secretion. We have the SEC or TAC pathways cross getting stuff over the inner membrane. Then we have this type 2 secretion system getting things across the outer membrane. Now, we actually have quite a complex uh, protein architecture here when we look at the type 2 secretion system. So in the outer membrane, we have this complex. We have a protein known as a secretin which is actually forming a pore in the outer membrane and allowing things to go through. There's a pilotin, which is actually involved in targeting things to, to be secreted. There are these so-called bitopic inner membrane proteins, or BIMPs, which um, 
are interacting with the secretion apparatus. They're stuck in the uh, inner membrane, and, and they're basically facing in both directions, towards the periplasm on one side, towards the cytoplasm on the other. And then you have this, um, and you also have this uh, secretion uh, dynamic associated SDA protein interacting. So you have in this, this inner membrane complex as well as these, you have these platform proteins and this ATPase. So again, as with other uh, systems we mentioned, there's ATP being hydrolyzed to actually get proteins across this system. So the pr platform, so-called platform proteins, highly conserved, interacts with these BIMPs and with the ATPase. We don't quite know what it's doing. It's part of this complex, and it seems to be important. But quite how it all fits together is not clear. Now, I mentioned the, these uh, bi biotopic inner membrane proteins. They're linking the cytoplasm and the periplasm together, spanning the inner membrane. They're probably also interacting with cytoskeletal elements in, in, uh, in, in the cytoplasm there. And there's the ATPase. Um, and at its most basic, there's just one of these in type 2 secretion systems. Uh, some other systems that are more elaborate might have more of these, and we'll say more about type 4 pili in a moment. The secretin in the uh, outer membrane, I already mentioned, uh, the best characterized one of these is probably a protein called PULD from Klebsiella. Uh, GSPD is another one that's been characterized, fairly highly conserved. And you get this channel in the outer membrane. There's this ring-like structure of the, of the life proteins coming together to form this pore. Um, and the pore is sufficiently wide that you can get folded proteins through it. So if you remember, we said that you get uh, things like LT assembling into the holotoxin in the periplasm and going through uh, a pore like this. Um, there's a kind of gating mechanism as well. So part of the end's not shown on this figure here, but there's an end terminal domain that sort of swings round and, and uh, closes the, the passageway until such time as a protein it, that's going to go through it is ready to be engaged and, and there's some signal transduction that allows this to happen. So um, that end terminus interacts with secreted proteins and we get, uh, so here's cholera toxin coming in, and we've got this possibility of interactions involving these beta strands, uh, particularly with proteins that already have beta strands coming in here, and this kind of crosstalk between the um, secretin and the secreted proteins in, in, in that way. Um, so I've uh, already mentioned, getting ahead of myself, mentioned cholera toxin, same with LT. You have this assembly in, in, a, in the periplasm targeting to the secretion system, possibly through interactions with secretin. Now, one thing we haven't mentioned up till now, though, is that in many of these type 2 secretion systems, you have something called pseudopillin. So you have a protein which is homologous to uh, pillar subunits, and it forms a pillar like structure in the periplasm. But it doesn't go further than that. It doesn't actually go out of the cell. And it's thought that this pillus like structure forming in the periplasm is involved in, in actually pushing things through, uh, helping push things through uh, the uh, outer membrane complex uh, through the secreting pore. Um, and that's rather <coughs> colourfully, it's been described as a piston pushing the proteins through. Now, related to the pseudopillin, there is actually a pillus, a real pillus, known as a type 4 pillus, associated with this kind of secretion system. This is found in a wide range of uh, different gram-negative bacteria and often is a key virulence factor. Uh, so, uh, meningococci, gonococci, these pili are actually involved in adhesion to mucosal surfaces and play important roles in pathogenesis. The interesting thing about these pili is they have the ability to retract, so they pull back, um, and as they're stuck to a surface in pulling and, and releasing and pulling and releasing, 
they can actually mediate a kind of motility known as twitching motility. Quite distinct from the kind of motility we're going to talk about in the next lecture, which is flagella associated motility. This is a, a different, uh, quite specialised form of motility. The other thing that these pili can do is they can actually mediate aggregation between bacteria. So we have the so-called bundle forming pillars in, in EPEC. We mentioned that, we mentioned that earlier. Uh, there's this co-regulated, toxin co-regulated pillars of Vibrio colony that actually allow bacteria to aggregate into microcolonies. So instead of just binding to host cells, they're actually allowing bacteria to bind to themselves. So you end up with this big colony hanging on there. Uh, to uh, in one in one place. So we have this pillus being formed in, um, in, in this is example here is drawn from Neisseria. You have this uh, type two secretion complex, similar kind of players. You've got ATPAs involved here. You've got this uh, producing these pillar subunits, which then assemble into in the, in the periplasm, but then they go through this hollow uh, secreting uh, pore in the uh, outer membrane and actually then extend outwards from the cell. And there's an adhesion at the end, uh, which is known as pill C. Um, so similar to the pill we've already mentioned before, they're being assembled uh, at the... Um, down here at the basal end of the pillars, and then the pillars is just getting pushed out progressively as the thing elongates. So the subunits that, that go into the pillars are secreted through the sec-dependent system, and as I mentioned, they're added to the base of the growing pillars. Um, and there's an interaction here where uh, that is kind of based on charge, so the end terminus of the last pillars that goes in is interacting with a glutamic acid residue on the new subunit. So there's this, char this, this, this charge uh, interaction. Platform protein is pill G and then there's an ATPA, it's homologous to the other ATPAs is in type 2 secretion involved in hydrolysis, forcing the pillars out of the membrane and in comes the next subunit and so on it goes. Now, as I mentioned, there's this strange phenomenon known as twitching motility, which we see in organisms like Neisseria gonorrhoeae. So the pillus is extended. Uh, the assembly ATPA is playing a role in that. It attaches then to, a, to the host epithelium, to specific receptors, so that the adhesion at the end of the filament is actually targeted to, to bind to something on the host epithelium. And then there is this retraction ATPAs, which pulls the whole pillus back. So that allows uh, movement to occur. So you've got this attachment, you pull back, and then it, the cell is moving along. Um, quite what role this uh, twitching motility plays in pathogenesis is, is not clear. I mean, we, we know it happens, and we know that these... Systems are important to pathogenesis, but quite how the, the whole thing fits together, it's not clear uh, currently. But it, there is obviously a role for these systems in adhesion, formation of microcolonies, and it's possible that there is some kind of sensing going on, that these are actually sensing, when they're touching the surface, pulling back, they're, they're actually um, generating force, which then may be transduced back into the cell and give signals. And we do certainly, you know, we see that with, the jello systems, and it's probably likely to be happening here as well. Uh, and in, another important uh, pillus that's actually part of this family is the so-called TCP pillus or uh, TCR pillus, uh, uh, or, or, or toxin co-regulated pillus of Vibrio cholerae. Um, and this is required for colonization of the intestinal tract. It's important in persistence. Um, it's a, a bit like a bundle forming pillars, it causes these bacteria to aggregate, um, and it's um, also involved in the secretion of this colonization factor, which is uh, secreted by this same apparatus. So this, uh, there's 
uh, a variety of reviews which um, I'll put up onto WebCT. This is a figure from one of them which we'll put up there for you to look at. But this just uh, draws together the, uh, variety, the, the similarities between these different systems. So you can see that the, the Type 4 pillar assembly system is effectively a subgroup of Type 2 secretion where you have the secreting pilotins, these BIMPs here, uh, platform, the assembly ATPAs. But in addition, you have some additional players here, the retraction ATPAs, and you have this pillus being formed there as well that goes outside of the cell rather than just stuck in the periplasm. Um, yeah, okay. Well, I've covered most of those points. Okay, so the last system I want to talk about today is the type 1 secretion system. So that's a way that we're giving you a trip around the zoo of secretion systems, but in previous years we gave a separate lecture to each one of these, but we decided that was a bit over the top this year. So type 1 secretion, here we have three components to this type 1 secretion system. So this system is spanning the whole cell envelope. There's an ABC transporter located in the, in, in the inner membrane. So this is a, a, a class of transporters. ABC stands for ATP binding cassette. So these mediate not just protein secretion, but they mediate the translocation of all sorts of molecules, peptides and uh, other small molecules also going through them. It's the ABC transporter that is energizing the process through the hydrolysis of ATP. There's a, then this thing called the membrane fusion protein, a trimeric protein, kind of acts as an adapter, and it con connects the things that are in the cytoplasmic membrane and things in the outer membrane. And then there's an outer membrane protein, um, the TOL-C. TOL-C is the kind of archetype of this group of proteins, but there's a, actually a wide variety of different members of the TOL-C family involved in, uh, in type uh, 1 secretion, they form trimers in the outer membrane. Um, and these systems, they don't just export um, these toll C proteins. They, they, they're quite promiscuous in what they export. They can export protein toxins. They can also start exporting antibacterial substances um, and all sorts. So just drawing this graphically, this is what the whole thing looks like. You've got these three different kinds, of, these three different components, three different subunits combining together to make a pore, a channel that connects the cytoplasm all the way through to the outer membrane. Um, so we've got these, this pore in the outer membrane here, this 12-stranded beta barrel. So pretty... Um, the vast majority of proteins in the outer membrane, in fact, are beta barrel proteins on this characteristic fold. Um, and this toll C uh, beta barrel is similar to what we see in another class of proteins called porins, which are also involved in movement of material across the um, uh, outer membrane. Then projecting down from there, you have all these alpha helices that are sticking out down into the periplasm. So the beta barrel tethering it in the outer membrane and then these alpha helices dropping down below. Um, and Corinarchus is the key name associated with this. A guy who works in Cambridge solved all these structures. Um, and we have a guy called Vasily Bavro who's actually joining us in the next few weeks who is also an expert on these systems and the structural biology of them. So what happens with these systems is you have uh, this membrane in the complex, the ABC transporter uh, and the NFP uh, contacting the outer membrane protein as the this, as this structure assembles. You get substrate recognition. So there, here we have a, instead of an N-terminal signal sequence, we have a C-terminal signal sequence. So different from what you see with the sec dependent system. The C-terminal signal, and the C-terminal signal is not cleaved off either. There's no equivalent of a signal peptidase here. As with the SEC-dependent system, though, we, we have these proteins remaining unfolded as they go through the system. So they have to be unfolded to get through the pore. 
So the MFP contacts this, this, the outer membrane protein, you get this conformational uh, change and you get formation of this uh, complex, this uh, transient complex. And it's ATP driving all this through. It may also be a role for the protein motive force in driving proteins through the system. There are quite a lot of different sorts of proteins that go through type 1 secretion systems. Uh, there is a, a whole family called the RTX proteins, which are, are commonly toxins. And they have this 9 amino acid repeat sequence that's rich in glycines and aspartates, and Gs and Ds in single letter code. Uh, and uh, these are very, very long proteins, often a thousand amino acids long. And this whole family of them go through the type 1 secretion system. Um, there are some things which are not toxins. Um, so we have these leukotoxins, but we also have uh, proteases, lipases, and so forth. Um, and we have S-layer proteins and uh, things involved in iron scavenging uh, also going through the system. And then I've now finished for today. So, um, as I say, Julia gave me these slides. And I've used most of her slides. There's a series of papers here, um, review articles, which you can look at if you want to uh, go into more detail on this subject. And I shall put these onto WebCT in the next few days.